Okay, well, welcome back to our, uh, our health and family segment. Uh, Dr. Troy, today we have a special guest. We do. Uh, Luke Skelton from Good News TV, and it gave yeah. me an excuse to wear a T-shirt. Awesome, awesome. Oh, I'm on now. Here we go. Yeah, I, gave me, I know. I'm, that is awesome. You can wear a T-shirt now. Yeah. So uh, maybe this would be a new standard as it gets hotter here. We could... Uh, we could start wearing t-shirts. Well, I'm Filipino, so I took the option, Elder Ed, about wearing my barong today, so. <laughs> there you go. Well, Dr. Troy, I've, I've had quite an adventure. This week I went, uh, I went back east, mm -hmm. uh, drove uh, uh, some, I moved, helped a friend move, and it was quite interesting going through uh, the different uh, states and how the different states are are dealing with the COVID-19. Uh, mm -hmm. Some places have masks, some places are totally shut down. Um, when I got to Tennessee though, it was like all the Adventists were out uh, just having fun. So it, it didn't <laughs> seem like there was anything going on Good. in Tennessee. Um, but I did, uh, uh, on the way there, I met a, or on the way back on the airplane, it was pretty neat. I met, a, I met a guy, and he may even be watching today. Tony and his family are out mm. here. Uh, his Praise daughter's God. getting treatment, and uh, hopefully he's, he's on air. But it's, it was an exciting trip, and I'm glad to be back. I'm awesome. Glad to, be, uh, to have you here, and, and Luke. Yeah, for sure. Well, I'm sure that Tony probably Great doesn't know who this man next to us is. So, and I think, you know, there probably are a lot of people that don't, that, don't really know who you are. So let's get to know you a little bit, um, Mr. Luke. Tell us about who you are, your family, and um, just your life, and also what your life's been like during the quarantine process. Well, testing. Yeah. I, I hate doing that, testing stuff. Um, yeah, well, so my wife and I have been married, I think it's been 26 years, and believe it or not, we don't have any kids. Uh, mm -hmm. Not that we prepared to not have kids or, or plan to have kids, but uh, it's just the way the Lord led. And um, uh, we're happily married, and I'm thankful that she's here. Amen. And um, that she's healthy as a mm -hmm. nurse. And mm -hmm. um, anyway, I... Susan and I both met at uh, an engineering college mm. at ASU, and um, I'm thankful, actually, that uh, we met there because I was not an Adventist, didn't know there was such a church that mm. went to church as I would think on the wrong day at the time, but um, I praise the Lord that he, that he introduced me to Susan and, Amen. and the Lord. So she, in a bit of ways, she was acting on the Savior's behalf. And Amen. Praise, praise the Lord. The Lord. She would say in spite of herself, and, and I'm not trying to criticize her, but she definitely gives glory to the Lord for that. So we are just really thankful to be, you know, serving the Lord now instead Praise of in engineering, either one of us. Susan's now a nurse. And, wow. and um, yeah, COVID has been interesting, I would say, you know, between Susan having to interface with uh, people mm. who are potentially at risk um, and... Uh, and trying to kind of recalculate that, you know, we're not looking out for ourselves, we're looking out for other people, right. which is why I brought a mask here. Right. You know, I may not think why. that I'm invincible, but mm -hmm. I want to be protective of other people. Sure. And um, so it's, it's definitely a unique day that we live in, as Adventists in particular. Right. You know, this perhaps may not be the end, but it seems like it's a wake-up call for sure. Sure is. Amen. Well, I know you said that you don't have a baby, but you actually do, you know, and so let's get into that. So your baby is Good News TV, for sure. And I kind of want to know the story a little bit about that. Like, how'd you find this ministry? And, you know, tell us how it was erected. What is your mission statement? Tell us your story about it and tell us about it. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And I, mm -hmm. I did bring a few slides just so that people can visually kind of experience this as we're going through. Uh, so this first slide actually shares, you know, Good News TV broadcasts 24 hours a day throughout the communities, 90% of the population of Arizona. And so viewers don't know it exists, they don't subscribe to it, they don't pay for it, they're just sitting there watching TV and they stumble onto it and the Holy Spirit starts working. And so this is kind of an illustration of that. And as they're watching, then, um, let's see here, as they're watching, clicking on the remote control. Next slide. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, 
back it up here. Back up. Okay, so I don't know how this is going to work very well. There you go. Okay, so um, yeah, so we're covering about 90% of Arizona. We started mm -hmm. broadcasting here in Phoenix. It's expanded into Payson, Prescott, Flagstaff, Yuma, and Tucson. Mm -hmm. And so covering about 90% of the population, we've been broadcasting for over 11 years. And yeah, I guess it's an 11-year-old right now. Wow. <laughs> and um, if you go to the next slide, sorry about that. Um, next slide, please. I can't, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, then beyond broadcasting 24 hours a day, Seventh-day Adventist programming, we also want to introduce people to connect them with our church families. Mm. And the way we do that is in particular, as an example here with Paradise Valley, is we promoted the uh, Christmas program, you know, mm -hmm. to encourage people to come. Mm -hmm. And then we actually broadcast that, which uh, we're thankful, uh, Pastor Hugh, that we got that uh, program. Uh, that's the top two uh, images. And then the bottom two are, interestingly, with um, Dr. Troy uh, promoting mm -hmm. the health challenge that started mm -hmm. in January. Right. So we encourage people to participate. We pray that they did. And, um, and uh, that's an exciting thing that uh, this church did as an outreach to help right. people get more healthy. And then the final image there shows uh, Steve Wahlberg when he was here uh, being introduced by Pastor Barton uh, there on the platform where we're sitting right now. So a variety of ways that we try to connect uh, our viewers with the church so that they feel like they're part of your family or they're part of our family and they want to come. So uh, that's exciting. That is exciting. So uh, it's a really quite amazing that over 90% of people are, are covered in Arizona. What are some of the specific things you're doing to, to reach out to people, to connect them in other ways? And some, sure. what are some of the fruits that you're seeing from that? So, well, during COVID-19, we actually um, have, you know, because people are now interested in or concerned with their health, mm -hmm. we have been looking at uh, how can we connect with the viewers directly in this particular environment? Um, you know, the first instinct is let's just go door to door and, you know, but people want to maintain a distance. And so, uh, anyway, we started offering an amazing, fa amazing health facts uh, mm -hmm. magazine. Mm -hmm. And uh, we ordered um, 50 of those, and we've had to reorder them because um, there's been so many phone calls from viewers who want to get the magazine. And mm -hmm. so um, we're just excited about, you know, one area that we've been able to, um, to actually add. In addition to that, we're actually on um, not only on TV, but we are also on mm. our website, websites, both English and right. Spanish uh, websites, and also on Roku, Amazon Fire, Apple TV, and um, and YouTube. And speaking about YouTube, let's see if uh, if I can get this to actually work here. Next, please. <laughs> speaking about YouTube, um, social media in particular, uh, we have seen a huge growth in and have been actually um, hmm. working towards increasing the. Uh, penetration, I guess you could say, into social media over the last few months in particular. And we've um, actually grown our YouTube channel by about 85 or 80 percent. Really? Uh, more than 80 percent. Um, and now we have over 18, uh, actually over 1,700 um, subscribers to mm -hmm. our YouTube channel. And um, one of the uh, Wahlberg, well, actually one of the Wahlberg programs that was here has like over 8,000 views. And um, others that we've had just have, you know, it's just been kind of exploding. Uh, so that's definitely been an area that has been exploding. And yeah. Facebook, we have over 1,800 um, uh, followers. Wow. And so just trying to reach people through that. And any of our videos that are on demand that are actually at on YouTube, um, we share through Facebook, you know. Right. And so anybody can do the same thing. If you go to our YouTube channel, you want to connect them with, um, with Good News TV and, and help them to get to know about different topics. If you just mm -hmm. hit the, you find a video you want to share, you just click on the share button, and then it will open up a window that shows like Facebook. And if you click on Facebook, it automatically goes to your account, and then you can put your own comments and you can post that video on your uh, feed. And oh, wow. so people will actually be able to connect with, you know, the truth 
through uh, through that. So it's really for powerful. Sharing, for sharing media. Amen. Uh, it is. A, because they can take it and post it. Yeah, and they can do that with mm -hmm. your church worship services yeah. and wow, any programs amazing, you guys uh, do. You want to share them with your friends? Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. It's now, let me ask you a question. So you said that there's been an increase in your viewership, especially through social media. Was that just something that has grown over time, or did you see a specific blip during the quarantine? Definitely during the quarantine. I mean, we mm -hmm. had a, an emphasis on, um, you know, addressing that and mm -hmm. trying to build that during this time. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, the, like a, over the last, literally the last couple months, which an 80% 80, 80 plus uh, mm. percent increase in yeah. uh, subscribers. How has that, have you, has that blip over the quarantine, has you taken a step back and sort of redirected um, ways that you guys are now going to approach your ministry? Well, absolutely. We're, uh, you know, uh, we want to be flexible. We want to um, look at different ways that we can be more and more effective. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, there's a lot of programs that maybe people wouldn't have watched in the past where you have somebody sure. looking at one camera and in their living room. You know, it, it looks maybe a little less professional, but people are accepting of that. You know, they know mm -hmm. that people are quarantined. And mm -hmm. so, yeah. And, and so, the, like the amazing thing, there's a, there's a, um, there's a series, uh, one of the, well, there's, I know that one of our Pacific Union groups is doing a prayer conference right mm -hmm. now that, um, that is for their uh, conference, but there's people around the world now that are actually participating. Right. And so even though it's a social isolated situation where you're yeah. only able to, you know, you can't invite a group of people to come to a, an event. Sure. Um, but you can through social media. And right. so it's actually getting more people to the event than, than otherwise. So it's right. just really fascinating yeah. how yeah. the Lord has taken kind of a bad situation and, and making it a good scenario. I agree, scenario. totally. It's very interesting. So besides social media, are there any other platforms that you're, uh, fi other ways that you're finding to connect to viewership or other pockets of people? Yeah, absolutely. And if I could uh, ask mm -hmm. to advance the slide mm -hmm. here. Let me advance a little bit more here. Um, okay, so let me just share real quick about Martha since we're on this uh, slide. Mm -hmm. Martha is actually one of our viewers in, um, she was in, in Yuma at the time. And she, uh, her husband actually died. Mm -hmm. And um, she was at the time, well, she wasn't of the, you know, Adventist belief system, but she sure. wasn't sure where is her husband, what's going <laughs> on with him, and she went to talk to some people and learned about purgatory, and that obviously didn't make her feel too comfortable. <laughs> and she discovered. I don't feel our comfortable channel. either with that, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she discovered our channel and found out that that her husband is resting and waiting on Jesus' return. Amen. Yeah. And she just said that really brought so much yeah. comfort to Praise her. Praise the Lord. And yeah. so she actually, um, she learned about the Sabbath. She learned about uh, a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And she was excited to find a church in Yuma that she could actually go to. She was excited about it. And she learned about baptism. She actually got baptized while she was there. Since then, she's moved to Sierra Vista. So she's still in Arizona. Mm -hmm. She's actually now a member, and they're excited to have her there in Sierra Vista. So wow. it's, um, so Martha is just one of many examples, you know, on social mm -hmm. media, the Mm -hmm. uh, there was uh, there's comments that we get from people that are around the world that are saying, "Wow, you know, I never heard this. It, mm -hmm. it took me uh, would have taken me forever to learn this, and mm -hmm. just stumbled onto your channel." So, so, so Luke, a, a person that's watching this right now, and let's say they want to tune into Good News TV, are they going to go to their cable TV box, or or how are they going to how are they going to access this? Yeah. So, um, yeah. It, and so the primary way to access it is with a TV antenna. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, in the old days, there wasn't such a thing as cable and satellite TV. It was just antenna. Uh, so that is... I'm, I'm maybe, back in the old days. I remember yeah, those times. Exactly. <laughs> you and I both. Um, and, and Pastor Hughes may be on the... On the He's probably uh, below we, me. We but used I to remember. have the TVs that you'd click yeah, with you'd the click dial. Uh -huh. those. Yeah. I used to have my brother used to have to hold the antenna yeah. and put his foot out. Yeah. I there remember those days. <laughs> So, yeah, so, you know, those are archaic days, but actually there is antenna TV. There's over, uh, there's about 100 TV channels here in Phoenix, in the mm -hmm. Phoenix community that you can watch. And Good News TV, two channels, English and Spanish, are a few of those options. 
And so that's one way that, um, that people can watch. Um, other ways is, as mentioned, uh, there's an app on Roku, there's an app on Amazon Fire, Apple TV, and, um, and actually on YouTube. So we can watch through these different, um, you know, the new technology with internet so streaming. I can take my cell phone and actually yeah. watch Thank you for asking. the news TV program. You can, you can, actually. Yeah. I can pull out my cell phone, there is an app on there. Um, oh, nice. That we're actually enhancing to add. A Good News TV app? There is a Good News wow. TV app. Good News TV app. Amen. Amen. Yeah, we, we're trying to get an Apple TV version of the, uh, of the mm -hmm. app. Um, that's a little more complicated, but uh, we're working on that. If you could advance the slide just a... Okay. Yeah, I'll just mention that we are actually um, helping some of the churches to live stream during this time because... Yeah. Uh, there's some churches, unlike Paradise Valley, that didn't know how or haven't been mm -hmm. live streaming or need some help. And so we've been helping in some areas with that. Mm -hmm. wow. And uh, we've been um, uh, supplying resources for outreach, such as bookmarks. We mm -hmm. ordered some more bookmarks. And let me just mention that we actually have um, T-shirts. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're walking through your community yeah. and you want to um, promote the ministry, Good News TV, hmm. and you want to encourage people to tune in for Good News... Nice. Then, um, then you can. I'll just give this to oh, you. Oh well, I have to admit, I was being a little covetous seeing his good news TV. <laughs> now I finally got my own. So the Lord answered my prayers. Amen. I'll make sure I put that on, and also on social media and like, because if we like uh, social media, we you know we need more viewers. Fifteen hundred is little. He needs yeah. to have about ten thousand. Amen. So I'll be wearing this Amen. proudly. Thank you. Thank so, you so very Dr. Much. Troy, what you're saying is you were coveting my T-shirt. I was coveting. I, it's a sin, but I admit it. Praise God. I'm on my knees. Thank you, Lord, for my salvation. <laughs> One other thing that we're doing during COVID, and, and there is a few others, but basically we're also in the process of calling our viewers, you mm. know, to find out how they're doing, to just make them, you know, another opportunity to connect with them. Mm. You know, this... People may, I mean, we actually naturally have a connection with them because they like Good News TV. People that call us usually, 99% of the people that call us. Mm -hmm. um, but then we, we have an opportunity to actually let them know, hey, we care about you. Maybe we can have a prayer together and so forth. So if any of you want to participate in that, yeah. then um, let us know. We'd love to you know, have some more of you to call some of our viewers to pray with them. That'd be a blessing. Um, could I get you to advance one more? Yeah, okay. Um, so the other thing that you had mentioned is, are we connecting in other ways? Are we connecting with other audiences? Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, one way we're doing that, and this is just really exciting to us, mm -hmm. is we've been talking in the past and, and just really felt impressed that we need to reach the young families for the Lord. Right. And so the Lord has put on our hearts, and um, we actually are excited to, 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 to share with you that just last week, uh, we started the Children's Channel in Yuma. Mm -hmm. And so uh, reaching more viewers, you know, during COVID-19 when more families are home and they have nothing to watch on TV. Well, that's what I would say anyway. Nothing good to watch on TV. <laughs> then uh, they can actually watch Good News TV. And it'll connect not only the kids, but you can imagine so many adults. Actually, we've had reports from um, some of our, I mean, this lady said, I think she said to Susan that she's over 80 years old. Oh, wow. And she was almost embarrassed to say she watches our kids' channel. You know, <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter how old, but it, it helps people to, uh, to maybe. Um, anyway, we're excited about that. And actually, this week, we started streaming on the Internet. And so the apps that we talked about, mm -hmm. Roku, Amazon mm -hmm. Fire, Apple TV, uh, we're going to be adding the uh, kids channel to that lineup wow. so that people can actually watch the kids channel. And so it's, it's just really exciting. And yeah. so let me back up just one. Along those lines, we've actually been able to start the kids channel in five of the seven communities of Arizona, which is Prescott, Payson, Flagstaff, Yuma, and the Verde Valley. Unfortunately, we still have Phoenix and Tucson. Those are the two largest communities, obviously. And so the, the, if you look at it, mm -hmm. that's actually about 85% of the population that we reach. Wow. And, and so we want to be able to reach people in Phoenix and Tucson. Well, amazingly, they've, the station we lease from here in, in Phoenix is giving us an, a huge opportunity. We lease uh, our English channel 24 hours a day for $5,000 a month. Now, that's an amazing price. Mm. Well, 
the station is actually going to let us broadcast for the first 18 months for $1,000 a month. Oh, wow. The kids' channel, 24 hours a day. Wow. And so, and then it'll double to $2,000 a month after that. But that's still a huge savings to be sure able to is. broadcast to the kids. So that, that, that money that you're talking about, that airtime that you're spending money for, you and Susan are paying for that out of your pockets, right? No, absolutely not. We would, <laughs> we would do it, but we'd be broke right now for sure. Um, but, so what, what we're saying here is that we need help. We need help, uh, yes. This is, a, this is an awesome, I think, the family, uh, uh, something yeah. that reaches families. Amen. Uh, and youth, uh, children. Thank you for asking. I just want to speak to his heart a little bit. I mean, one of the things, the heavy lifting that he's shown this morning that he's doing is that he's helping churches do what we do. We're blessed here at Paradise Bay. We don't know how blessed we are that we can stream online and, you know, praise the Lord. The God gave you a message to do this for us. We were prepared. We didn't know it was going to happen at the time, and it worked out for us. But think about the thousands of churches that didn't have this capability that he's decided to put on his plate to do the heavy lifting yeah. for. I just think that's really amazing. You know, I, speaking about which, I had an opportunity to take a tour at his facility a few months ago before this all happened. And the things that he's doing to try to convert, you know, we've gotten accustomed to seeing things in high definition, you know, and he's got this project about turning everything over so our eyes can get attuned to that again. And so just could speak to that a little bit. Pastor Hugh mentioned that. What are some of the needs and transitions that you're trying to do to take your, the ministry that we all need to the level of the standard of level that we're accustomed to to compete against the other stations? Well, so we definitely, I appreciate you asking and, uh, and mentioning that. We, you know, our heart has definitely been reaching people for the Lord. And that's really what uh, we're instructed. I mean, that's what Jesus did. He was sacrificially giving to other people. And I don't know about you, but I'm selfish, you know, and, and mm -hmm. I'm struggling with that. And I want to love people more than myself. Now, that mm -hmm. is not possible. How can we do that? Mm -hmm. You know, but that's what Jesus is calling us to do, to actually love our neighbors as ourselves and each, even favor one another above ourselves. That is crazy. Mm -hmm. But that's what the Lord wants us to do. Mm -hmm. And anyway, so, um, yes, what we want to do is we want to improve the quality of what people see on the image. You know, right now we've been broadcasting for 11 years, and so HD TV wasn't... Uh, wasn't as regular, you know, 11 years ago, but it is now. Mm -hmm. And so we need to take the older technology and replace that with technology so that people are more accustomed to looking at a sharper image. And so we uh, are working towards that. We've been buying equipment, as you saw, yeah. and preparing to do that. But it's taking time, it's taking money, and it's taking prayer. And so in addition to the kids' channel, um, we also are trying to kind of raise the bar, so to speak, and start uh, mm -hmm. being able to generate an image on TV that is more high quality, that's more of an HD image, mm. so that viewers won't just turn the channel because they're already uh, maybe biased against just what it looks like before they even listen. Right. So we want to take away that bias mm -hmm. and help people to just look through that and the Holy Spirit and stay, you know, and pause on the channel. And so... That's been, uh, that's been a project we've been working on, and we're anticipating uh, releasing hopefully sooner than later. But like you say, we need help. You know, I can't empty out my bank account more. I'm not trying to yeah. you know, say anything about myself. We would if we need to, but we are so thankful for the support we've gotten so far. We just need more help, definitely. There's huge projects to work on, right. and we are so thankful for the privilege of being able to do what we're doing. And um, so... That's, that's kind of, um, yeah. you know. There's this old adage, you know, that says, like, if you treat something as special, then it will be seen as special, right? But if we treat something as is not so special and not very valuable, then other people don't think it's valuable. And so when they go through this and they say, oh, this doesn't look good, it must be hokey, and they'll move on. So, I mean, it would be nice if we can all support it. I mean, this is an exciting ministry that it's growing. And I just feel that in this time, I mean, this is really kind of the tip of our spear on it. Um, and so, you know, I know you have a question, but I just have this one question and it gets yours in. I have to ask this question. 
do you think that we're going to go back to the way it was? Or do you think that things are going to be different from this point moving forward because of what we're going through? Yeah, I think the life, as many people have said already, um, normal is just changed. You know, what the definition of normal is, is probably changed forever. What that means, I don't know. I can't be a prophet for sure. But um, certainly, and there's good things to that. You know, the mm -hmm. idea of actually thinking of other people before we think of ourselves, that's not really natural to do. Mm -hmm. But to actually put on a mask, not because I'm worried about my health, but I, I want people to think that I'm not being reckless with their health. Mm -hmm. You know, I want them to think or realize that I care about them. Mm -hmm. And I think through that, the Lord is giving us an opportunity to connect with people. Right. You know, if we uh, just you know, in the midst of COVID, reach out and, you know, and hug, you know, get face to face with somebody. Well, that may have been acceptable six months ago, but it's not now, mm -hmm. you know, and to, you know, it's going to be changed. I, I don't know exactly what that looks like, but um, we'll have to use unique ways to actually connect with people in a real meaningful way. For right. Sure. Right. Well, I just uh, want to say thank you, Luke, for coming. Uh, we're, I'm getting the flags that we're out of time. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Troy has been. They always a, blame me. I'm sorry. A, a great, <laughs> a, a great segment. Um, just uh, a few seconds, Dr. Troy. Yes. What's the uh, the COVID-19? How are we looking? Yeah, you know, we have to be careful on COVID-19 because the, our numbers are still kind of trending down. They're kind of flashes and down, flashes and down. But there's one that statistic that I'm concerned about, and that's that. Um, and the, we were winning the battle. Uh, you know, there's this one graph that's important to show that um, overall we're kind of going, trending down. And I'm a little concerned that that uh, thing that I've been following along is now starting to trend back up. So uh, we have to be careful and we have to continue to be um, safe because um, it can come back in a reckless abandon. Yeah. If you guys study the 1918 flu, um, uh, you guys should look at the Spanish flu in 1918 and um, in the fall was actually a bigger hit. So we just have to continue to be careful. And I'm a hugger and I'm having a hard time because I want to see people and I just want to hug on them. You know, and I've got a shirt that says, careful, I'm a hugger. But you know, now, you know, I'm gonna have to put a mask on that says, because I love you you know, yeah. or something, but yeah. it's tough, but continue to do it because of our love for each other. And um, so that way we can protect ourselves and protect people around us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Dr. Troy, let's have a word of prayer. Amen. Uh, Luke, would you, would you pray for us? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for the time that you've given us in this world to reflect on our, um, our own characters, uh, our own motivations and our desires to reach other people and may they be stimulated may they be um, expanded and may they actually be exponentially growing in our amen. hearts and our minds to reach people while there's still time amen lord our neighbors our friends our family everyone all of your children need to hear about and learn about you and um, although this has been a life-changing and continues to be a life-changing experience that is going to be a bigger impact when people start running out of money and uh, <coughs> yes. and they realize that uh, they don't have food to put on the table. Mm. Lord, help us to be generous. Yes. And we ask that you'll just give us divine appointments and do as Jesus did to reach the people where they're at mm -hmm. and to minister to their needs and then to provide for their uh, and pray for them and just... Uh, and just help them yes. um, in any way we can. And Lord, I ask that you'll help them to be interested in wanting to follow you. Yes. May you direct us. May you help us through this experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Good morning, everyone. Glad to have you here at Paradise Valley Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, I've noticed from last week to this week, we have a few more people uh, coming in, and, and I appreciate that. We're getting back to uh, regular services, and hopefully sometime in June we'll be able to take the masks off and, and, and uh, get back to a little bit of normal. But one of the neat things about even 
something like this pandemic is the fact that we as a church now have a, even a wider reach. Um, if last Sabbath I noticed, uh, we got the statistics from the YouTube channel that we've been live broadcasting, and we've had on average, as of not last Sabbath, but the Sabbath before, on average of 500 different people watching the YouTube channel at one time or another, and over 4,000 people that have accessed the YouTube channel at one point or another. So even though the, there seems to be some kind of a crisis and a tragedy, God always brings good things out of bad situations. Amen? That's what he does. If you look through the Bible over and over and over again, he gets us through these things, but he brings a good, um, a good outcome out of a bad situation. So this morning, I just want to continue to ask you to pray for good outcomes, ask the Lord to bless us, and we are glad you're here. Whether you're here uh, locally or you're listening to us online, we are glad you're here worshiping with us today. It's almost impossible to sing with our masks on, and our projector up front here is acting up this morning, but we're still going to try to sing three stanzas of number 100, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And if you're watching from home right now, stand up where you are and sing along at the top of your lungs. Number 100, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Yeah. 
Let's bow our heads. Gracious Heavenly Father, we invoke your spirit at this time to join us today. You have planned a blessing for each one of us this morning. You have given us your grace and your power. You have brought us here. You have drawn us here. And Lord, I just want to pray that as that, that blessing enters our heart, we will draw closer and, and have a deeper worship experience with you and with those with us. Thank you for your power and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church family and guests also, and uh, happy Sabbath and welcome. Uh, I pray that everyone is staying healthy, and it sure feels good to be back in this church worshiping this beautiful church. Now is the time in our service to present our tithes and offerings to the Lord. Today's offering is for the local conference. Today that I see we have our leader, Elder Keys, and his wife Lillian here today. Within our Arizona conference are different church congregations, but all are united with a common goal of spreading the gospel and also the Adventist mission. Your gifts support the local conference-wide programs that benefit all the churches, including ours. These programs include funding Christian education, summer camps and vacation Bible schools, local evangelism, and also other special projects within the conference. We all know the importance of raising children in an environment of wonderful Christian education, which gives them a window or a look on what it would mean for them to choose God's way of life. Proverbs 22, verse 6 says, Train up a child in a way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Well, due to our social distancing uh, practices that we're doing, there will not be any um, deacons that will be passing a tray around, but there is an offering jars that are labeled in the lobby out there. Also, remember that there is online, online giving also. 2 Corinthians 9-7, a lot of you know this verse. It says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. We thank you for your cheerful giving, and let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for giving us the opportunity to be good stewards. We pray that you will guide us to properly manage your house of worship. Please bless these tithes and offerings and use it for your kingdom and your glory. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. As Manny is softly playing, um, just want to go through um, a little bit about the online giving again. We've been trying to make an emphasis of that in the last few Sabbaths because uh, there's been a little bit of confusion. There's a couple of different places that you can give online. First off, you can give on uh, AdventistGiving.org if you go to your computer and, and there's a link to it there, but just type in AdventistGiving.org or you can just do it right from your iPhone or your Android device and um, that's actually how I do it myself. We have uh, an opportunity to 
to set that up. Now, make sure that you go to the Paradise, the Phoenix Paradise Valley Church. There are several Paradise Valley churches on um, the website on Adventist Giving, whether you're using the app or whether you're using the internet. And uh, make sure you look at the one that says Grace Place and having people there together. And we have a link there on our website as well. Now, uh, we, they have places for you to give, tithe, local offerings, parking lot, whatever you want to give there. There's, there are places to give. And in fact, I just want to be you know, very transparent. That's how I give. Every time I get paid, I come to church, and, and it's, a, it's a habit of mine when they're doing the offering call, the deacons are, are taking up the offering, or like now we're just kind of having a little time for people to give. I get on my app, I put in my tithe, my offerings, I hit send, and the Lord blesses, and it's just an easy way to do it. But I do, I do that usually because it's a community event. Giving is not only just a... Um, uh, an individual event, but it's a community event. So we want to encourage you to use whatever method. You can send it in, you can come here, we, whatever method, but uh, we want to just emphasize the AdventistGiving.org and the apps that are available. We're now at the time of our prayer, and we'd like to have you stand and we're going to sing together 671 as we come to you in prayer. Uh, we're not going to gather here at the front like we normally do as we try to keep our social distancing, but uh, sing along as we invite God's presence to be here before Elder Mike prays. Raise your hand. You folks at home do the same. It's time now for the prayer. And if you would, please kneel as far as possible. Our kind, loving, heavenly Father, we're so grateful this morning to be able to come to church it's been a while since some of us have been here. We ask, Father, for your blessings this morning. This is the memorial weekend, Father, and we ask that we remember we ask that you remember the families that are suffering because they've lost a loved one in the service of their country. Bless those families. Bless the families of those that are recovering from surgery, from all types of illness, and especially from COVID-19. And Father, we ask that you bring a swift end to that. We ask that you answer the prayers. We know that you saw those raised hands, Father, and you know the needs. Supply the needs according to your will, Father. And be with this church. Let us go from this place with your Holy Spirit. Send the Holy Spirit to bless the pastor as he gives the message. 
And may each of us feel that spirit in our hearts as we leave this place. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Church family, we are so grateful to be here today. Um, it's kind of uh, rough to see you guys with the mask, but uh, that's how it has to be. And uh, we feel honored uh, to praise the Lord this morning. And Ketsi and Sebastian, they were singing for the adventurer camp, uh, virtual camp uh, the conference is having. That's why Sebastian is with the uniform. And uh, this morning, um, I'm going to invite you to open your Bible, if you have it, uh, Psalm uh, 23. And Ketsia is going to be reading this psalm. Okay. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in the green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are there with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare the table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint me my head with oil, my cups, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. This is um, this Psalm 23 I learned at a young age, and I wanted to, to pass it along. Um, when I am uh, struggling in life, I always come back to this, and, and this is a beautiful promise. So uh, we're going to be singing the Psalm 20, 23 today.
Thank you very much for the music. I always love it. I am such in awe of musical talent, um, especially when you bring the kids in. It's great. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Let's give them another amen. How about that? Amen. Very good. Um, this morning, I want to uh, kind of continue in on a little bit on the themes that we've been talking about the last, uh, the last few weeks here, and that's been the death, resurrection, of Jesus and the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and, and what it means to the world and what it means to Christianity. And, and the bottom line, I've named my sermon this morning, You Matter, because the bottom line is what the Bible is trying to say is that you matter. You do. You matter. This is all about everything that Jesus went through, his life, his death, his resurrection, is all about you mattering to God. And a lot of times we get a little confused about that. You know, we, we think it's the, maybe this is the church building or, or it's the, the organization or, or it's the, the politicians or the rich people or the poor people. But the fact is that you, in God's eyes, matter. That's the bottom line message of the, of the scripture. And I'd like to take a look at just a couple of the... Um, a couple of stories here in the book of John that illustrates this point. One of the difficulties that we have as, as human beings in reading a story, any story from any time, uh, any time period, even 20 years ago, frankly, is understanding the context of the story. And the vast majority of the misunderstanding that happens in the Scripture is understanding the context of the Scripture, understanding what the, the culture uh, was around it. Um, I, I would hate to have, if, if time lasted that long, if Jesus didn't come in 2,000 years, to look at some of the, the, the texting that happened today and make any sense out of it at all as a historian. Not even knowing the language. And, and I, I, one, there's one word that I think that would baffle historians in our culture, and that's probably Super Bowl, Right? Can you imagine being a historian 2,000 years from now, looking back, reading something, someone is referencing the Super Bowl, just referencing it, not explaining it, not any, but they just got a reference to a Super Bowl party. And if you're a historian with no, no concept of what's going on here, you would think that everybody's getting around this very large bowl and having a party, right? Because you don't have the context, you don't have any of that, that uh that cultural context. And so one of the difficulties is understanding the scripture because we don't understand the cultural context in which it is written. It has nothing to do with the fact that, that, um, that we're, we're ignorant or anything like that or we're dumb. It's just that we sometimes just don't know the cultural context. And so that's why it's so important to understand these type of things. And there's a couple of two very interesting and deep stories that are in two encounters that Jesus has in John chapter 3 and John chapter 4, and it happens for very specific reasons, and this morning we're going to explore that some. John chapter 3, let's start there. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Now, one of the things that I want to stop right there and, and explain the cultural context of this. First off, if anybody calls you a Pharisee in our day-to-day, uh, if, you know, today, if somebody said, you're a Pharisee, are they giving you a compliment? No, they are not. Not at all. But I want you to understand, back in the first century, being a Pharisee wasn't a bad thing. You were one of the good dudes in society. You, you, you were taking the law of God seriously. You wanted uh, the law to be kept. You wanted all of his rules to be kept. By the way, do we emphasize that today as a church? Sure, we emphasize the law of God. We emphasize some of the rules when people kind of uh, get, get distracted by, by the world and we, we urge them to come back to, to holiness and to, to uh, following the Lord. Um, and that's what the Pharisees were, were mainly trying to do. Now, one of the problems that the Pharisees had was that, again, we view the law of God in our context is a bunch of like rules that you, you open up the Bible and you see, well, here's a rule here, here's a rule there. The Pharisees saw it 
as deeper than that. They saw it as the nation. They were going to purify the nation so that the nation could provide a, a, uh, a messianic age for the, mess, for the Messiah to come into. Okay, I, I hope that's clear. In other words, what the Pharisees wanted to do was they wanted to create a, na a national movement of purity and holiness so that the Messiah would look down, a God would look down, and he would say, hey, these, are God, these guys are ready for the, for the Messiah to come because they're so pure. All right? And not only they're pure, but they, they've got all their heritage right. They, they have all their lineage with Abraham. They've kicked all the Gentiles out. And they've got this beautiful nation for the Messiah to come into. And so this is where the, the Pharisees got into trouble because the, the number one thing that they did was they were focused on that outward, um, that outward view of how, the, how they viewed one another and, and emphasizing these rules and forgetting that really in God's eyes it's the people that matter and not necessarily just the rules. Okay, The rules are good, but it's the people that matter. Um, but in general, in that day, Pharisees were kind of good dudes. I, I, I want to um, be a little transparent here. Uh, when I grew up in the church as a, as a young kid, you know, 10, 12, or whatever, if the pastor was to come over to my house, I thought we were in trouble. Honestly, it's, if, if, the, if I came out into the living room and the pastor was sitting there, I thought, oh my goodness, what's, gone, what's happened? What did the family do? What did we, you know, and again, that's a little 10, 12-year-old. In other words, I had this picture of the pastor being this, this holier-than-thou kind of enforcer a little bit. It wasn't a good picture. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that that's what it should be. And so when I decided to become a holier-than-thou enforcer, um, <laughs> I wanted, and, and this is true, I wanted to make sure that people knew that I was approachable because as a kid, I never felt like the pastor was approachable. I don't know, maybe, maybe, that was just me. I, I, maybe everybody else had a different uh, view of the pastor, but I didn't want my ministry to be one where I was the Pharisee that nobody, the untouchable Pharisee that had it all together. Trust me, I don't have it all together. I'm pretty close, but not quite there yet. Yeah, you all are laughing because you know me. <laughs> um. So this is what he was. He was this, this very good dude, holier-than-thou almost guy, but not in the sense that we would think a holier-than-thou. When people looked at him, they thought, man, he's got his life together. He's got his religion together. And he was a ruler of the Jews, which meant he was rich, and he, and he had a lot of influence. So Nicodemus is, by all accounts, got his life together. With, with just those two things. You, you understand what I'm saying? He comes into the church. You don't think this guy's a mess. Now, notice what it says here. He's, got, he's a Pharisee. He's a ruler of the Jews. And he comes to Jesus by night. Now, folks, Jesus was around during the daytime. Right? He's in the temple preaching. He's got people around him. He's going and eating. He's doing this. He's doing that. Why did this Pharisee, this guy who had it all together, come to Jesus by night? He, would, he didn't want anybody else to see. He didn't want anybody else to see. And by the way, did Jesus kick him out? No. You have to understand here, God meets us primarily where we're at. And if you're a mess, he meets you there. If you're not a mess, he meets you there. Okay? And I'm talking about culturally. I'm talking about as far as the outward concerns are. If, if you seem to have all your life together. And I've got to confess something. The Lord speaks to me the most when I'm laying in bed staring at the ceiling at night. I don't know about you. But that's when things start. That's when you start really thinking about, at least for me, the big things in life. You know, that a lot of people are out there. I know that the, the, you, you get out, a lot of these loud mouths out there, and, and I might be one of them arguing about atheism versus Christianity or this or that or whatever. Folks, it comes down to this. Where are you with the Lord at night? 
when, when you're all by yourself, when you're staring at the ceiling, when, when life, you know, there's nobody else around, when you're not having some deep philosophical or religious argument, where are you, the, the Lord, with the Lord at night? It's just you and him. There, there's nobody else. Your, your spouse is asleep. You're staring at the ceiling. You're wondering what it's all about. Where are you? When you, where are you with the Lord at night? And so he comes to him at night and he says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. He starts out with this massive compliment. We know you're from God, Rabbi. By the way, he calls him Rabbi, which means just teacher. You know, there was a, there was a lot of teachers, a lot of dime a dozen teachers. He doesn't approach him as the Messiah. Now, when you do Bible study and you look at the, the different ways that, that Jesus reacts to people in the Scripture, there's a lot of different ways he does it. He reacts differently normally how they approach him. Okay? You, you'll see what you see over and over again, the Gentiles, the blind people, the sick, the lame, they call him son of David normally. Now, when they call him son of David, what do they mean by that? You're the Messiah. You're the one. You're the, you're the guy we've been waiting for. You've got power. You've got everything. When you call him rabbi or teacher, what, how are you approaching him? Yeah, he's a, you're a, you got some good things to say. Lay, lay him on me, man. We'll, we'll see here. You know, that's a different approach. And the reaction Jesus normally has is different. A lot of times when people are, are approaching him as the Messiah, he shows a messianic power. So he, he approaches him here as just a rabbi and, and gives him this big compliment that God is with him, doing good, good stuff. Man, I like your ministry. You're, you're an awesome guy. I've got a few questions for you. So how does Jesus react to this approach? He says, now, of course, when someone gives us a compliment, we have this thing in our culture, and they had it back then too, where you're fishing for a compliment. You ever heard of that? Somebody, kind of, you, you go up to somebody and say, hey, nice tie. And you hope that, you know, if you're looking for people to notice your tie and no one's done it, you might point out that they've got, you know, hey, nice tie. And then you're hoping that they will what? Hey, nice tie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you've done it. Come on. Everybody's done it. We've all had, had you know, there. I very rarely say, hey, nice haircut um, <laughs> to anybody. And so, so he comes with this compliment, expecting a compliment back. Hey, you're a good dude, you're a ruler. Hey, you got things going on. No, what does Jesus say? Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, in our context, we hear about born and again. This is a spiritual experience. We need to get, you know, get saved or however people want to do it in our, you know, talk about it in our context. What Jesus was telling him, you have to understand what Jesus is telling him. Now, well, let me read the next, the next verse here. Um, Nicodemus' response, verse 4. How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time in his mother's womb and be born? Now, isn't that an odd thing to say, especially in this spiritual context? But you have to understand what Nicodemus' worldview was. Nicodemus' worldview is this. First off, in order for you to even be part of this whole kingdom of God that's going to happen, you have to have the right heritage. You have to be born of the, you know, you have to be able to trace your lineage back to Abraham. There has to be no messy, messy lineage going on there. You've got you've to know that your father is Abraham and, and your, you know, your dad and his dad and go all the way back. That's why genealogies were big back then. You know, we have a lot of interest in genealogies today, but it very rarely has to do with inheriting the kingdom of God. And that's exactly what they were trying to determine. They are inheriting the kingdom of God because of their genealogy. So they've got this genealogy. Then once you've got the genealogy, then you can start building this, this perfect life. And so what Jesus is telling them by saying you must be born again is that genealogy, that heritage, that everything you've built up, you being a ruler, all this kind of stuff is worthless. You've got to start over. And that's rough for a person who's got a good life to hear. Amen? Not tough for somebody who's, who's messed up their life totally. 
It's rough if you've got it all together to hear that. You're like, what? Come on, man. I've got the right genealogy. I've got, the, you know, I've got, got my act together. I've got my education. Everybody's respecting me. How come I've got to be born again? Why, how do I, why do I have to start over? And notice what Jesus said in verse 5. Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the Spirit. Now notice he says water and the Spirit. What does the water represent? When you go down into the watery grave, what does it represent? Death. You are dying. You are dying. And then the Spirit brings new life. Okay, so, so he says you've got to be born of the water and the Spirit. You've got to die. Now, Jews were very, 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 in his day, very understanding about cleansing. They knew cleansing and all this kind of stuff. Jesus is, is making it deeper. And, and I don't have time to quite go into that because I, I want to spend more time on the next part of this passage. But, but he's telling him he has to die. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. Now I want to focus, I want to go back here a little bit and, say, and take a look at, at uh, verse 6 here in, in more detail. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. What is he saying here? One of the things that I've noticed in my, um, in my uh, oh, pastoral ministry is that most of the fights, well, let, I, let me clarify here just a second. That which is born of the flesh is the, is the flesh. Let me, let me tell you, that the flesh takes two extreme positions. It takes two extreme positions, and then there's a bunch of mix, uh, a mix of all of this. But the flesh in its, in its extreme over here is what I like to call lawlessness. In other words, you want to do your own thing all the time. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. You know people like that, right? You know, a lot of times they get into drugs, alcohol. They're just a mess. Their life is, is just in shambles. And they just go out and they do their own thing and, you know, whatever. They don't pay any attention to God's law. Now, the other... Th extreme that the flesh takes is self-righteousness, all right? And the self-righteous are very careful about what the law, what, what the law says or what God says or, or whatever, and they're very, very cognizant about how things look on the outside. They want to make sure that everybody knows that they've got their life together, and they've got a lot of advice for everybody, Okay? Well, I did it this way, and I did it that way. I, I, you know, honestly, to tell you the truth, I probably tend more towards that side of the thing because, you know, I'm smart, and I got a lot of, of, of advice for people, right? So, you know, you, you get these two extremes here. And what I find in the church is that these two extremes, the two extremes of the flesh, fight a lot. This side, the lawless side, says, ah, oh, your rules are too heavy, man. I'm going to go do my own thing and be saved. This side is like, hey, man, I'm doing the right thing, and I'm going to be saved because I'm doing the right thing. And they fight a lot. The color of the carpet brings this out quite a bit at the church, right? You know? I mean, but the fact is, what Jesus is saying here is whether you're a self-righteous jerk or you're a lawless jerk, it's still of the flesh. And guess where the flesh ends up? In the lake of what? Fire. And so you guys can argue about the color of the carpet in the lake of the fire as well. Because that's where the carpet's going to be. Right? Amen? Is the carpet going to be? You know, I've wondered sometimes, some of the things that we argue about, I wonder sometimes if the carpet or the pew color or the paint color or all that if they're going to make it into the temple in heaven. You know, God is going to, he's going to come down, the, the new Jerusalem's going to come down, everything's going to be burned up except this patch of carpet, and he's going to build the new Jerusalem around it. Amen? Is that what's going to happen? We argue about nonsense sometimes, folks. And what I find is the uh, one side of the flesh, uh, you know, one fleshly group is arguing with another fleshly group. What comes of the flesh is flesh. Whether it takes on this lawless 
at this lawless look or it takes on the, the self-righteous look. And that's why it's, it's difficult for pastors, especially, uh, you know, when, when you're trying to keep peace and you see that, you know, we're all arguing over something that really doesn't matter in the big picture. It's difficult for us pastors sometimes to, to kind of get enthusiastic about those arguments, frankly. I'm just talking personally. Maybe others do. Um, so Nicodemus said, answers said, how can these things be? Jesus said to him, are you a teacher in Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, I, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If you, I have told you earthly things, and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one is ascended to heaven, but he who has come down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. Verse 14, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now I'm going to stop there just for a minute. I want to go back to what we were talking about the flesh. What is the the, um, the cure for the flesh problem. The spirit. That's exactly right. The spirit. Not being more lawless or not being more righteous, but it's the spirit. Amen? So what Jesus is trying to do, what he's trying to get people to do, is get out of this argument over the lawlessness versus the self-righteousness and change the paradigm and get you into the spirit. Amen? All right. So he's not going to, you know, God may not take, if you've got two groups, both working from a fleshly aspect, one are promoting lawlessness and one's promoting the, the self-righteousness, God's not going to get involved in that argument. Amen? You might win the argument. But the fact is, God wants you to change the paradigm and go with the Spirit. Amen? Now, this is the context of the most famous and most uh, memorized verse in all of the scripture, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So, he's coming to Nicodemus here. And, you know, Nicodemus is a good dude. And I, what, I, what I mean by that, he's a good dude. He's got his life together, you know, he, he, he's not a problem, he's not a, a drain on society, he's respected in this community, he's doing his best to keep the law of God. And by the way, you know, a lot of people would call him, like, the Pharisees are hypocrites and things like that. I think some of the Pharisees were really, really searching, they really wanted to do what the Lord wanted. You know, and, and I just want to clear up what a, what a hypocrite is. A hypocrite is not a person with high standards. A hypocrite is someone who has these high standards does, and acts like he meets them when he doesn't. Having a goal is not hypocrisy. Okay? Having a goal or a standard that you're not yet meeting is not hypocrisy. Now, I want to I give you an illustration of this. Okay? There, there has... Um, I, I, I've recently gotten into, you know, in the last few years, kind of gotten into fitness. I know some of you all have have gone on one of these journeys too. And, and what I, I started running for a while and it kind of hurt my knees and so I, I quit running because I wasn't being chased. Um, but I, I, did a little bit, I did a little bit of that, uh, did a little research into running. And what I found was that the, the mark for most male runners, I mean really, really serious male runners as far as the mile is a four minute mile. You've heard of the four minute mile? That's like the holy grail of running, okay? Now, there's only the, the first four-minute mile that ever happened was in 1954 by Roger Bannister, and he was 25. Now, if I'm a runner, if I'm a person who's running, especially if I'm young in this, and I set a goal of a four-minute mile, and I start out, and I'm at, you know, eight minutes, or, and then I get up to six minutes or whatever. And my goal, and I tell everybody, I want to do that four-minute mile. Am I a hypocrite? No, I'm a person with a goal. If I look at the law of God and his standards and say, you know what, by God's grace, I want to hit that. Am I a hypocrite? No. Am I hitting it yet? Maybe not. 
But, but it's just like somebody working on, on that four-minute mile. They want that four-minute mile. They want that four-minute mile. They're not a hypocrite. They're just a person driven. And folks, we need to be driven for holiness. We may not hit it all the time, and I'm not going to sit up here and tell you that I have, because that's what hypocrites do. Hypocrites act like they've got it all together. And I don't. But I know that God has a standard for me. I'm not there yet. I'm still running towards that standard by God's grace and his power and his spirit. But that doesn't mean I stop running just because I haven't hit it yet. And that's just like these people training to hit the four-minute mile, that four-minute mile. By the way, 1,400 men have hit the four-minute mile. It hasn't even been hit by the ladies yet because, they, um, you know, I guess they're slower. <laughs> just, I, I'm just going to say it. <laughs> No, there, there are physical limitations that are there. But there's, there's different goals there, too. And by the way, the goals sometimes deal with our context that we're in. What are our abilities? What has God gifted us with? What, what is God doing in our lives? You know, so, so again, having a high standard is not hypocrisy. Acting as though, and that's really kind of what the word hypocrite means in the Greek, it's, you're, you're a play actor. Acting as though you've got it all together when you really don't. That's what a hypocrite's all about. Have those goals. Let God set those goals in your life, and by God's Spirit, um, reach for those goals, and he'll bless you. So Nicodemus, uh, back to John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, I want you to understand, he's talking to who? Nicodemus. He's a good dude. He's got his life together. He's a respected guy. He's a Pharisee. He's got everything going for him. And Jesus said to him, you need salvation just like everybody else. God so loved the world. He put Nicodemus in that world category, just with, like with everybody else. And folks, I don't care if you're rich, poor, respected, uh, not respected, whatever, you need Jesus. Amen? You need Jesus. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved because you and I matter. We matter. Bottom line, if you are down on, your, on yourself, I, I tell you what, what, what very interesting thing that I'm seeing here is this, this social distancing. They're, they're saving us from the virus. But depression is, is exploding because we need each other and we need the Lord. And even though that sometimes these, these things happen where, where we become isolated, um, you know, the worst thing that they do to people in prison is put them in isolation. Amen? We need each other. We need the Lord. And, and that's something to be key. No matter where you are, no matter what you, where, where you're at, no matter how you're feeling, you matter to God. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the condemnation, that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Now, remember, he's talking about evil deeds. Most of the time when we think about evil deeds, we're thinking about the, the bars and the partying and all that kind of stuff and fornication and all this kind of thing. He has just put Nicodemus in his pharisaical state as a person who is living in the flesh, but he looks like on the outside he's got it all together, he put all of that into what category? The category of evil. Because it's coming from a self-righteous stand. So it doesn't matter whether you, you look like, if it's not of the Spirit, it's not of the Spirit. It's got to be of God in order for it to not be evil, for it to be good. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, and that's why some of the Pharisees we're on the front lines trying to get rid of Jesus. You know, one of the things I, I will have to say, uh, um, when talking about the Laodicean church, Jesus says he'd, he'd rather we were hot or cold. Why, why rather cold? Why would he rather you, you be lawless and, and have your life messed up? 
because you know you need him. That's the thing. It's very tough for a self-righteous person to admit that they need the Lord. And that's, that's, a, that's, I think, honestly, that's where lukewarm is. You know, you look good, but you're not. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. That's on both sides of this. But he who does the truth comes to the light, and his de- that his deeds might be clearly seen. They have been seen in God. The next story here is the woman at the well. I'm going to do my best to get through this as quickly as possible. But you've got one guy who seems to have all his whole life together. You've got one guy who's, who seems to have it all going for him. You've got one guy who's been in the church or he, he's been in the, you know, whatever. He hasn't missed a, a Sabbath ever. He's, he's got it going. And Jesus says, hey, you need salvation. Now you've got another gal. And you know this story. So I, you know probably where I'm going with it. But listen to what Jesus says here. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard, well, I'm going to skip down. He goes up to Samaria. And uh, he, it says he needed to go up through Samaria. Now, what I want you to understand is back in the day, um, they used to skirt Samaria. They didn't want to go up there because Samaritans weren't pure. They weren't uh, pure-blooded Israelites. They, they had intermarried. They had intermingled. They, they're, they're, um, they, they claimed to serve God, but even their worship had become adulterated as, as the Jews looked at it. And so he came to the city of Samaria, which is, Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. Um, It was about the sixth hour. Now, the sixth hour is in the middle of the day. You know, again, what's the contrast here? Nicodemus came to Jesus by what time? Night. Here he is in the middle of the day. And in the middle of the day... Verse 7 says, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. All right, so let's just, I want to stop, put in the context. This doesn't mean anything to us. Everybody thinks, ah, she just needs some water like we do. We go to the faucet, get the water, and and move on. No, 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 she was going to the faucet. Excuse me, she was going to the well to get, get the water in the middle of the day. When it was hot, most of the ladies would have all gone to the well together, Beginning of the day, when it's nice and cool, gotten the water for the day, why do you think she is going there in the middle of the day when it's hot and no one else is going? She didn't want to, you know, listen, folks, what, what do people do in, when groups, when they do things together, what do they do? Talk. Yeah, it doesn't matter, you know, man, woman, whatever, you get together, you start talking, and she wanted to avoid all of that, and we'll find out later why. I mean... I, I got to be honest with you, she, she was a, a person that Jesus reached and gave her heart to him, and I, we know that and, and all of that, but her life was a mess, amen? It was a mess. Let, let's read on here. For his di- disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. In other words, she, she's trying to create some social distancing here. <laughs> Leave me alone. Um, why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now notice the contrast here. Nicodemus, he goes by night, but he starts out with this compliment with Jesus. Oh, you're a good dude, Jesus. We like you. You're saying some good things. You're doing some awesome stuff. Jesus approaches this woman in the middle of the day, and she comes back with him, comes back at him kind of with an insult. What are you even talking to me for? I'm a Samaritan woman. You don't have any dealings with me. Get, get, you know, why, why am I going to do anything for you? I want you to understand, folks, no matter how God approaches us or we approach God, we matter, and he's going to work with us. I want you to understand that. That's why, that's why uh, it, chapter 3 has one story and chapter 4 has another. No matter where you are in your life, no matter where you've been in your life, God is going, God is going to approach you, God is going to take you, and he is going to give you the same basic message both times. You need him, and you need the Spirit. Jesus answered and said to her, 
Oh, excuse me, I already read that. Verse 11. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then um, do you get that living water? She's getting a little snarky with him, just kind of like Nicodemus did with the, with the going back into the womb comment and coming out. Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of the water of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. I want you to understand what Jesus is saying right here. Everything we get in this world is temporary. Everything. I don't care if you've got your life together or you don't have your life together. Everything in this world is temporary. You drink of the water of this world, you will what? Thirst again. If you drink of the water of life, if you get the spirit from God, that's eternal. See, the same, different problems. This woman had different problems. Nicodemus had different problems. Different attitude, different everything. But the solution was the same. The solution was the same. But the water that I get, shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, well, you have said, well, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. The woman said, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. <laughs> Really? <laughs> now all of a sudden he comes to, she comes to, well, you're a prophet. <laughs> there you, you got it all. You got it right. Folks, listen. I want to, I, you know, again, I don't know where everybody's come from, but I've got dark stuff. I've got bad stuff in my past. God knows all about it. Don't hide from the stuff that God knows about. Amen. That's just, God knows about it. Get it out there with God. I'm not saying share it with a planet or whatever, or, or even with the person next to you. I'm saying get it out there with God. Don't hide the problems with God. God knows. Sometimes our life is a mess. Whatever we're doing, we're a mess. That's okay. God knows. The, the solution is the same. You matter, number one. And number two, he's got the spirit waiting to, to help you, to give you strength, to give you new life, to give you that water of life. Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Now, verse 20 is funny because this woman did exactly what we do all the time. She tried to deflect. God shows her the problems in her life and, and she tried to deflect. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain and you Jews say that, it, that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. She deflects to some bigger argument. Folks, it's not about the bigger argument. It's about your personal life. Okay? And we, we try so many times when God shows us something to deflect or when somebody else shows us something, to do, we deflect. Get some kind of bigger theological argument or whatever. You know, as a pastor, I'll have people be upset and they'll, they'll approach me and they'll be upset with something. And, and a lot of times I've, I've just stopped them and I've said, are you Okay. Because what I find that, that when people are feeling raw and when they overreact or when they, they get angry and things like that, they're a lot of times not mad about what they're mad about. It's a lot of other stuff that's built up. It's a lot of other garbage and stuff. And so they have a tendency, we have a tendency to deflect. And the real issue is over here, but we, we start yapping about this issue over here, some, some theological issue and, and things. And... and that's what this woman was trying to do. But Jesus said, and he just cuts right back to it. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship that which you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation of the, is of the Jews. So there's a truth aspect to the salvation coming from the Jews. There was absolutely the truth there. And Jesus is not doubting the truth. He's reaffirming the truth. 
But the hour is coming, and now it is, when the true worshipers will worship Father in, the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is spe- seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Now, what he's saying here basically is this. You can go, one, one of the things that pagans do, the pagan mindset, is that you go to the temple uh, you know, on the top of Mount Olympus, or you go to the temple here, or you go to the temple there, you give your little offering, you give your little sacrifices, and then you go live your life as though God doesn't exist. That's, a, that's paganism, folks. What God wants is not you to argue about which temple you need to be in, but to have the Spirit in your life all the time, ever present with him ever always with him. And that's what he's saying. That's where we worship. That's where true worship comes up when you're at home. You know, one of the things that we've discovered is that as much as we love gathering together, and we need this, folks, we need to gather together. When we were apart, we still had the Lord with us, right? Absolutely. Now we're coming to back together and and praise the Lord for that because I've been missing it uh, terribly. But, But... The fact is, God wants to make sure we're worshiping him at home, in spirit, and in truth, and then coming together and worshiping him together. That's where real, true worship comes along and and makes our lives whole again. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will teach us all things. Jesus said to her, "I, I who speak to you am he. At this point, the disciples came. And they marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. You see, folks, when God really touched it, you know why I know that God touched this woman? that Jesus touched this woman, that her heart was changed in that moment, in that encounter, because she started telling other people about it. That's how we know. That's how we know. If we just keep it in and we're just like, oh, well, this is just for me, that's, n- n- nothing's happened. Nothing much has happened. When the Spirit of God gets into you, you've got to share it. You've got to say, hey, listen, <laughs> you've you got to see this guy. He told me everything about it. And by the way, folks, they knew everything about her. It was a small town. They knew who she was. Amen? That's, that's the way it is. And so she came out and said, hey, this is guy. Not only did he tell me, the implication there is that he's got solutions for the life that's a mess. And I, and I mattered to him. That's the beautiful message of both these chapters. Whether you're rich and your life looks good, whether you're poor and your life's a mess, you matter to God. And whether it's anywhere in between, you matter to God. Every day, God is seeking you. He is looking for you. He is encountering you. And he is doing his best where you're at to bring you the message of everlasting life because you matter and he loves you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for the graciousness that you've shown to each one of us. And as we as human beings, we, we are unsure of where we are with you. And Lord, I thank you that over and over and over in the scripture, you emphasize how much that we as individuals matter to you. Everything that you've done is all about bringing us to heaven. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your spirit. May your spirit live in each one of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.